Hello there, a uh, very good evening and welcome to Government in Transition. I'm your host, Eddie Lane. I'm joined this evening via Zoom by Charles Ramson Jr., attorney at law and a candidate of the People's Progressive Party Civic, and Sonia Parag, another candidate of the PVP and also an attorney at law, and of course, the Honorable Brigadier Mark Phillips, the Prime Minister elect of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Uh, Regular Phillips, Sonia, Charles, good evening and welcome to the program. Pleasant good, good evening, evening to Jeff. all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ed, and thank you to our, for our viewers who will be with us again this evening. Today is a sad day in the history of Guyana. It's an embarrassing day for our country, um, for Guyanese um, at home and abroad. Today, we saw naked attempts to not just insult the intelligence of Guyanese, but to insult the intelligence of reputable organizations, reputable individuals, and the world at large. Much of tonight's discussion will focus on the embarrassing presentation by Basil Williams, uh, the former Attorney General, and of course, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Karen Cummings, to the OES Permanent Council, uh, which met today to discuss the electoral impasse or the political situation in Guyana. Brigadier Phillips, you participated in, in that um, virtual meeting of the OES Permanent Council today. Um, you made your presentation. Former Attorney General Anand Nandalal also participated and he made his presentation. And we heard presentations from um, almost all the members of the OES, including uh, the US and Canada, Venezuela, and every other country. Uh, Brigadier Phillips, how do you respond to the lies, misinformation, and the embarrassment that we were made to face as a nation when Basil Williams and Karen Cummins spoke today. Well, thank you, Ed, and again, good evening to our viewers. And uh, first of me, again, thank our viewers for being patient. And uh, many of you may have listened to the OAS um, meeting today, which was aired you know, on social media. However, what is important is not necessarily the lies by Mr. Williams. What is important for us, Ed, is the OAS has convened this special meeting of the permanent council of the OAS to discuss Guyana, to listen to a report on the electoral impasse and the general political situation in Guyana. I don't know, nobody has they had such a, such a, um, a meeting of the permanent council to discuss the country. But I wish to mention the positives here. All the members were present for that meeting. They were represented. And uh, there was no dissenting voice. And I wish to leave this in the minds of our viewers. All the countries present were clear in their submission that they want this electoral impasse in Guyana to come to an end as quickly as possible. And the of the recount must be used for the declaration. Very clear. What Mr. Williams did today, our Attorney General, indeed was an embarrassment to us as a nation. That there's no need for him to misrepresent the ruling of the CCG. And I know the attorneys will deal with that in more detail during the um, presentations. There was no need for him 
to misrepresent the ruling of the CCJ for the simple reason that the ruling of the CCJ has been in the public domain in writing. It has been in the public domain, I think, just about four hours after that ruling. So the entire world can put their hands on that ruling and read for themselves. I don't need to tell them, Mr. Williams, lie today. They can read for themselves and they will arrive at the same conclusion that we already arrived at, that he misrepresented that ruling today. And it's not good for Guyana. What is good for Guyana is that the entire membership of the OAS is calling upon GCO to clear this election as early as possible using the results of the recall. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Phillips, um, for your opening comments there. I'll, I'll bring you in, Charles, uh, your thoughts. Um, I'm sure that you would have uh, listened to the presentations um, today. Your thoughts. So today, uh, you would have seen the culmination of what continues to be the humiliation of Guyanese and Guyana by the APNUAFC. And I would like to make a call on the APNUAFC and David Granger in particular to stop humiliating Guyana and Guyanese on the international scene as they are doing currently. And in this event of this rigging, this public rigging affair that continues to be broadcast internationally has now overtaken our notorious label of being the Jonestown country to now becoming known as the uh, most calamitous rigging operation the world has ever seen. And I, it is an international embarrassment and it is destroying the reputation that we have uh, both as, as citizens, but also amongst our regional partners and international partners. Um, what you saw the Attorney General do uh, at the OAS meeting and in, in the case that they have uh, that is extant, where they said that the CCJ had invalidated the recount order, not only is that not true, it is a national disgrace that he can go and lie on a professional issue. Not only are you lying about political issues, but you're lying about a professional issues. Listen, I know what an attorney general should look like. We've had a long line of industrious uh, attorney generals who've had very credible reputations amongst their peers and as being leaders of the bar. This is the worst attorney general that we have ever seen this country have. And he is taken us to the depths of deception uh, just because they are protracting, they intend to protract the inevitable swearing in of the legitimate government that will be sworn in and that will be uh, the People's Progressive Party led by um, Dr. Irfan Ali. I, I, I support the point that Mark is making that even though it was an international embarrassment for us to reach to this level where we are being schooled by the OAS about breaching our democratic principles of which we are bound to adhere to and bound to honor and bound to advance even though it's an international embarrassment to see that individuals would lie like that and, and have reason to be brought to that forum to be lectured to for this purpose, it is also a very strong position to be in for the supporters of democracy and to see that Guyana returns to this democratic country. Because you, you, we know now how important it is to have uh, powerful friends uh, and powerful countries and powerful organizations that are willing to be on, on the side of uh, democracy 
and and uh, the rule of law. Without that, you would have seen a a much more difficult fight um, being waged on behalf of the APNU AFC in the form of bullyism, and they would have uh, would have been able to succeed already. But because there are a lot of people, not only in Guyana, but around the world and organizations that are around the world that have, they, they understand, number one, how it is, how long it has taken for our countries to get to the point of recognizing the importance of being a democratic country. They, under, they also understand the importance of what being a democratic country has brought for those countries, things like human rights and respect for property and things like that. They understand that and, and they also understand that it's their responsibility by virtue of being part of that those organizations for which they are required to advance. So I think that on the one hand, it is an international embarrassment and, and the, our current uh, caretaker representatives or illegitimate representatives who are on their last leg on their way out they have, have embarrassed us in an international way and they continue to do that. Um, but on the other hand, it's also been a good thing because it has shown how far uh, this fight for democracy has gone. And, and it also shows that people are not giving up and that we are going to be able to win this. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, Sonia, your opening comments. All right, as we looked on today at the OAS Permanent Council having their adjourned, I'm uh, sorry, their meeting, uh, we would have seen again, as a matter of fact, I sat, I looked at uh, Basil Williams and Karen Cummings, look into the faces of all these distinguished leaders and continue to spew their lies. And as Charles would have said, said, the depths of their deception, I would say their deception has no end. It has absolutely no end because on a daily basis, they continue onwards spewing their venom. And I say venom because it has become poisonous to our country. We have had a meeting adjourned, a meeting that very few countries would have to reach at this level to discuss something like this. But then the positive, I suppose, to all of that is that these countries recognize that Guyana is on the brink of a democratic, of a, or a democracy is on the brink of collapse. And as a result, they needed to say what they had to say today. Their presentations were on point. Every member state, every member state endorsed the democratic principles. They committed to stand with Guyana as we as we hold on, as we try to hold on to the ends of democracy as we're holding on right now. Because unless we have that declaration to swear in Dr. Fanali as the, uh, to, to reflect the will of the people, democracy will go to waste. It will go all the way down the garbage bin. So what we're doing is holding on to that. They have recognized that. They have come out. They have spoken about it. And not only spoken about it, but they have actually said, look, the pillars of dem democratic principle is that you, re you respect the will of the people. If you have been voted out, step aside. The power is in the people. Do not seek to usurp that power. And this is basically what they have said to the nation. And I see it as, again, both with Charles and with, uh, with Brigadier, that it's both, it has its pros, it's had its pros and its cons. And its cons would have been, look, we, we are convening this meeting basically to tell you that you need to stop doing what you're doing. You need to stop holding the country at the, the, the people hostage. You need to completely stop. Now, Ms. Cummings came out and said that the council must not on duly influence our constitutional and judicial processes. Really, the only obstacle to a declaration reflecting the will of the people has been by the coalition. They are the only ones who have been usurping the power of the people, who have been usurping democracy. 
And that was the only reason we had that meeting today. That was the only reason that the member states thought it necessary to have that meeting today. So, you know, Basil, Basil Williams sitting there and speaking his lies in the face of these people, in the face of these distinguished persons, is complete disrespect. I mean, I want to say other words than disrespect, but we are at the forum here, so I'm going to say disrespect, blatant disrespect. You know, and but we have seen that all over. They have been like that from the inception, and it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop until they are stopped. Thanks, uh, Sonia. You you mentioned um, the lies, and one of the blatant lies of Basil Williams, which and you know what is sad? The sad thing about all of this is that somehow Basil Williams thinks in his head that all these distinguished uh, individuals, ladies and gentlemen who sat um, and who participated in that um, general council meeting today, uh, permanent council meeting, sorry, somehow just returned from probably Mars or something. So they had absolutely no access to information. They had absolutely no access to information. Many of the countries represented on the permanent council um, had either their diplomatic representative present in Guyana or would have received the report of the OAS um, electoral observer mission in Guyana. In addition to that, the OAS observed the recounts. The OAS, um, the US ambassador, the, the diplomatic missions of many of the countries, they would have participated. And Basil Williams believed somehow he could have gone there and say to the permanent council that the Caribbean Court of Justice nullified the recount order and the recount results. So maybe I should just share again, just bring this back up and maybe read what it says here. And if you look at the last paragraph, I'll, I'll antedate it. If you look from here to here, it says, and this is from the, the CCJ um, ruling, unless and until an election court decides otherwise, the votes already counted by the recount process, the votes already counted by the recount process as valid votes are incapable of being declared invalid by any person or any authority. Maybe I should read it one more time. Unless and until an election court decides otherwise, the votes already counted by the recount process as valid votes are incapable of being declared invalid by any person or authority. I don't know how that could be translated to invalidating the, the, the recount order or invalidating the votes uh, that were counted during the recount. And I believe, Sonia, earlier you were trying to use uh, polished terms yeah. to describe them. I will say that Basil Williams and the coalition people are mad. They've gone mad. Don't tell they're me gone mad. They think challenge. everyone. They've they gone mad. They think everyone is brain dead because clearly they don't think that anybody has any semblance of understanding to understand the CCJ's judgment that was read out, not only read out, but a decision was was given explicit uh, expressly on paper. Uh, you know, they they have they've they've they're wearing paper bags over their head. So they're not seeing everybody else when they're lying. Uh, thanks, Sonia. Um, I want to I wanna highlight a statement, uh, Charles. I know you want to come in here. And interestingly, and very strong, Sir Ronald Sanders made a, 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 a statement that I think will be stuck with me for the rest of my life. You know, we say justice delayed is yes. just denied. He says democracy. democracy delayed is democracy denied. And that is exactly what we're seeing 
in Guyana. Charles, we bring you here before I begin the Prime Minister. Yeah, I wanted to just pick up quickly on, on the, the madness that's happening inside of the AP and UAFC, but in particular, really, it's the PNC. Let's call it what it is. And I know the PNC really well, and I know a lot of these individuals. And I would tell you that it's not madness. They have a mental disease. They have been brainwashed like, like persons who have been schooled on a particular thought that it's become cons that it's consumed their mind and it's consumed their being. They believe that they are required to rig elections. That is their sole basis of being involved in elections because they don't believe that they can win free and fair. So Burnham taught them that they must rig elections and must do it in any means necessary or by any means necessary. And it's been drilled into their head so much that it's this mental disease that they can't change who they are. So when it is you see that they continuously in this, in this when they continuously lie in this way where they're not flinching, most people would flinch after a few times or they would not want to go and carry through their lies till the end because they know they got to continuously make up lies to fill another lie and, and catch another lie. For them, it, it, they have become so perfect at lying because they know that they are, they are riggers. They have to rig elections. And so it's this mental disease that has captured them that they don't even know that they're telling lies anymore. And, and I think that the country is lucky in one way, even though it's been horrible what we've had to go through over the last five months, especially during a time of COVID, when you have this, this uh, health crisis where people, whenever there's a crisis, you've got to turn to your leaders for help. It's, it's those times that you need leaders the most. You need to be able to rely on your leaders the most in a time of crisis. And during this time of crisis, it's been horrible because you've not been able to get any assistance from the government. And, and what I could tell people, especially from the AP and UAFC persons or the persons who still want to support them, the international assistance will not be available for them to get any uh, crisis assistance or health assistance or any kind of assistance that, that goes along with uh, COVID, that international assistance will not be available if they are sworn in because the international community has already made up its mind that they would treat them as illegitimate. That is what the, all of the foreign uh, ambassadors and the, the financial agencies uh, representatives, that's what they've already said, that you will not get any assistance from us because you're an illegitimate government. So it's this mental disease that is, is, has captured them. And it, in the one hand, it's been horrible. But on the other hand, it's good too that Guyanese must be able to see this, see the PNC for who they are. And that is a fundamentally anti-democratic uh, rigging group that is determined to seize power what may seem as though it's the ballot but it's not it is they have never held power in this country by free and fair elections and that is what their idol has taught them david granger is no different he's part of this school too his idol is also burnham the internationally known rigor who destroyed guyana and turned us into the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So what I would tell people is that, that this period of time, even though it has cost us five months, not five months in, in power, but it's cost Guyanese people five months to be able to see this, it will cost the PNC five decades because nobody will want to touch them with a 10-foot pole. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Uh, Brigadier, I want to take you back to the meeting of the OAS Permanent Council. And, um, and we spoke about the, the, the strong statements um, from all 
the countries that participated in that meeting today. Um, we also saw a, a very strong tweet from the um, from the Secretary General of the OAS um, with regards to you know uh, whatever has been happening in Guyana. I am trying to bring that up here so that we can probably share it with the public before I bring you in, uh, bring it here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it up uh, right now. And this is what he said. The current situation serves no purpose in Guyana. We call to stop using the judiciary branch to avoid bringing a solution to the country. It is time to make decisions and protect democracy and the will of the people expressed in the elections. Um, this point clearly to the AP and new AFC abuse of the court system, um, using their surrogates to run to the courts uh, with the same matters over and over, um, just that they're, they're, they're coming in the names of different persons. Well, you know, you're quite right there, you know, Ed, because we started by using the term electoral impasse or political impasse which basically signifies that there's a disagreement and therefore we cannot move forward. We cannot progress, right? Towards this whole finality or declaration of the, of the election. Yes, we were, had a, a phase where there was a disagreement and therefore the term electoral impasse was necessary. But what Mr. Almagro, identifying to us that we are at a stage now where it's not electoral impasse, but it's a case whereby the judiciary is being used and abused to obstruct the progress towards a decoration. That is what is happening right now. APNU AFC, along with the elements of GCOM that are sworn loyalty to them, because you know, GCOM officials are supposed to be professional, impartial, but we have uncovered at least two officials, Mr. Lowenfield and Mr. Mingo, who are doing the bidding of the APNU AFC, and therefore they're not professionals as far as I'm concerned, they're not impartial. They are working along with the PNU. And the PNU AFC is keeping this matter in court to obstruct the declaration of the results. A result that we all know, a result that the entire world was informed of. Through the recon process, as you know, I like to remind people, 460,000 valid votes, 233,000 of those valid votes were for the PPPC. The APNU AFC got 217,000 and the smaller party got just about 9,000. So it is clear to the entire world and I know all Guyanese already aware that the PPPC has won these elections. The whole world is over three weeks or four weeks now. Origin, the GCOM, you know, to declare these elections and they must use the results of the recon. And every time GCOM tried to make a move towards that, what happens? You have a matter before it, and I'm told now they have a fancy Latin term. I wouldn't bother to to um to pronounce res judicata. Res judicata. <laughs> okay, where basically it's just the, the 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 individuals who name is before the court applying for the case is changing. But when you read through what they're going before the court for, it remains the same. I think the judges now are reaching the point where they're getting fed up. They're getting fed up with 
this obstructionist behavior by the APNU, AFC, and their lawyers. And, you know, we had a ruling yesterday, and this afternoon we had a filing, right, for the case to be heard before the Court of Appeal. So here we go again. GCOM has to wait until the matter is dealt with in the court before they make a next move. So here is what Mr. Almagro is mentioning, right? The obstructionist behavior of the APNU AFC trying to abuse the judiciary system. And he's calling on us again to move towards a declaration in the interests of the people in the interest of respecting the will of the people and in the interest of Guyana remaining a democratic nation. Um, interestingly, um, you mentioned, you know, the fact that, and, and I alluded to it too, that these matters are all the same. Matter of fact, when you listen to the ruling of the, the, the Chief Justice yesterday, she itemized. She itemized the paragraphs that were taken from one matter and brought into the Missinga Jones case, um, and, and all that were being sought um, were dealt with um, and ruled on by the court. So I think not just the judges are getting frustrated and fed up with, with the kind of behavior of the AP and the AFC. The world is fed up with them. We saw the, the permanent council. Not a single country uh, said anything in support of the, the coalition not a single country, they all spoke in favor of democracy and they all endorsed the position that the electoral process must be brought to an end. And the only numbers that we have available to bring that process to an end at this point in time is that of the recount numbers. But talking about the judiciary, um, you know, and I was just reading a story, I think while you were talking, Sonia, and I saw in Venezuela, um, I think um, there, is, there is an attempt there. Um, if I can find it back quickly, I may want to read the headline quickly. Um, an interesting headline uh, with regards to um, Maduro and a, a judge in uh, Venezuela, um, where I think there is, oh, US offers 5 million bounty for top Venezuelan judge, uh, Maduro's ally. Um, interesting story. Of course, but I think the point here is that, you know, Mr. Pompeo, when he made his statement, he was being lucid. He said, it is not just those who will benefit from um, rigged elections are the ones who will face sanctions, but also those who are working to undermine it, those who are, who are aiding and abetting the process. Um, so I just, I just wanna put that out there that you know, we have to be careful. Um, every single person who is participating, if you know that the exercise that you're gonna participate in is undermining democracy, is trying to steal an election, is trying to thwart the will of the people, then you are making a decision to open yourself to face the consequences that may come. And we had the OAS today, we saw those positions. CARICOM is meeting in two days. And I suspect the CARICOM position is going to be similar to that of the OAS because we heard the, the, the CARICOM's permanent representative, uh, representative to the OAS spoke today. We heard um, the Antiguan Barbudian permanent representative to the OAS spoke today. So, you know, it is important for those who are participating in this exercise, including some of the lawyers to bear in their minds that you know you're participating in an illegal activity and there are consequences, be prepared to face the consequences. Uh, Charles, I'll bring you in here. Yeah, it, the, the only distinction that I would draw there because um, it, it may very well be that some people can interpret that as judges will face those kinds of uh, uh, penalties and consequences. Not, not necessarily only unless there's this pattern of ruling in a certain way which is very clear that you are acting in concert and uh we've we've we have some signals already that there may be some individuals who um 
are acting in a certain way, but I don't believe that the, the, con the consequences extend unless it is very obvious that, it's, that you are uh, ruling in a particular way, which ordinarily that decision should not make, be made. So for example, you would have heard that during the uh, ruling from the Chief Justice acting yesterday, that she would have quoted from the previous case, the Ulita Moore case. The Ulita Moore case where she says she is bound, she is bound that when the Court of Appeal ruled that it is, the, when the APN UAFC had challenged the uh, GCOM's ability to do a recount, what the Court of Appeal uh, said in the Ulita Moore case was that that is a decision for GCOM to make. So if it is now that the same judges go ahead and rule, overruling their original uh, position, which was that they ruled that it, the decision to do a recount is GCOM's decision. That is within their entire legal sphere of, of uh, requirement and, and, and responsibilities, then those, question, those decisions and rulings will obviously be looked at with, with a much keener uh, microscope, under a microscope and in a much keener light. So uh, we don't want any kind of impression to be created, however, for, the, for, for judges, but the, the attorneys on the other hand, they are the ones that I believe that also should be sanctioned. And this is not, a, this is not an easy thing for me to say because I am, I am also an attorney. And so I consider that some of these individuals or these individuals form part of my fraternity, of, in my profession. However, they're trying to destroy our country. They're also destroy, trying to destroy the lives of people including myself of because I'm I'm part of the people that are living in this country and in removing uh, uh, or trying to install a rigged government uh, and foist that onto this country it will destroy the lives of everyone so all of the people who are rep who are appearing in the case on behalf of the AP and UAFC or, or on behalf of the chief elections officer or on behalf of um, or uh, the, the, the quote unquote, the, the citizen, but really and truly it is on behalf of the AP and UAFC. Uh, they are known uh, attorneys who have been appearing in this political uh, bout since the beginning. In fact, they were present even in the Justice Patterson case when they, when the when uh, President Granger had preached the Constitution and in his unilateral appointment, they were also appearing on behalf of the government in the 33, 34 uh, stupid case. Um, and then now they're here and some of them are candidates. So I am, I've heard the calls being made about uh, sanctions for those attorneys. And a lot of them could be said that they are just doing their job, but they're not. These points that have that they are raising have already been raised. They've already been raised. They've already been determined. And they are determined, these attorneys are determined to see that Guyana has a rigged government again because some of them are candidates. Some of them are candidates. And so they are direct beneficiaries of, of this but uh, some of them are also involved in some mega schemes of corruption. And they're worried that they're also going to be exposed as a result of this. Uh, Edward, what you got to understand is that this attempt to hijack the country is not only for power, it's for what power can do for personal enrichment. And it's the gr this grand involvement of corruption that they are so they're licking their lips to get back into power, and that's why they're shameless in their pursuit of getting back into power by rigging. Thanks, Charles. I want to bring you in here, Sonia, and um, I know you will comment on, on, on the point that I raised and that Charles would have commented on, but I want to put this out there one time so that maybe uh, you can you can address your mind to it. 
um, when one look at, and, and to endorse what you said, Charles, about the, uh, these attorneys who are participating in these cases, um, while they may want to claim, like you rightly said, they're doing the job, they're representing their clients, they have to look at the implication their actions will have on a nation. They have to look at that. And what essentially they are arguing for there is to seek to get the court to endorse uh, Mingo uh, Lowenfield's report, which reflects uh, 475,000 uh, votes based on the tabulation that he did, when just 460,000 plus people voted. And that's the, that's the issue. 15,000 more votes than voters in the elections. So they are trying to use the court. I mean, the CCJ would have spoken to this issue. The, the Chief Justice would have spoken to this issue. And I, I don't see how a court, any competent court, will want to say that you had 460,000 plus voters, but we are going to help you to endorse a report that is reflecting 475,000 voters. Something is terribly wrong there. Sonia, I bring you in here. Just like Charles, I am also in the fraternity and therefore you don't want to hold your, the members of your fraternity to the, you don't want to take them to the gallows. But really and truly, if we're looking at the situation of judges, erring in law, thereby having a flawed decision, does not at all in any way warrant sanctions. If you become an enabler in the perpetration of a fraud that seeks to undermine or thwart the will of the people, that most certainly warrants sanctions because you are no different from the person who brings that fraud forward. You are no different. There is no distinction anymore. So while I can't, I will not, I will not specifically say anything as it relates to our judiciary. I just put that out there because that is my view. Now, in relation to attorneys, we have all, we would have all taken an oath when we were admitted to the bar, all of us, and it was to uphold justice, it was to uphold the law, the principles of justice. As an attorney, if you continuously abuse the court's process in also trying to enable the perpetration of a fraud, not, not only will you be in violation of that oath, but it would also be highly unethical and it would also carry a criminal element, which warrants not only domestic sanctions, such as substantial costs, sub such as being brought before the Legal Practitioners Committee, but international sanctions. Because why? Because it, it goes directly back to the principles of democracy and the international community its foundation for every organization that we are signatory to. The foundation is democratic principles. So if you continuously disrespect, disregard uh, all of those principles, breach those principles, there will be consequences and the consequences will inevitably be sanctions. We've already had one phase of sanction. Continue down this path and the higher levels of sanctions will come. So okay. that's really all I have to say in relation to that. The Chief Justice yesterday, and Eddie, I just want to quickly state, she really did put her foot down and say to the public, a myriad of persons cannot be permitted to engage the court with multiple applications regarding the same issues which has been decided and shield behind the claim that they were not a party to the previous proceedings. To so permit would be to waste precious judicial time and resource and cannot be allowed. That was in effect a judicial whipping. So that's all I have to say. Dear, dear, dear um, Brigadier, res judicata. 
I think that is where it derived <laughs> from the, the entire ruling, the fact that those matters went before the courts and they were determined by higher courts. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, if I go and I change this clothes and I come back with something else, it doesn't change that I'm Eddie. The ACO. It doesn't change this. It doesn't change that I'm Eddie. I remain Eddie with different clothing. And that is exactly what they're doing. Interestingly, as usual, he's become known for this. MIA, David Grange is always missing in action. You know, Brigadier, you will know more um, than I do as a former member of the military, where the commander don't usually always be on the, the battlefield. If he commands the troop from somewhere, and this is what we're seeing with Granger here. Granger is trying to paint himself for the public as though he has nothing to do with all of this. But I believe, and I keep saying this every single night, that David Granger is the intellectual author of all of this. He is the mastermind. And, you know, I want to endorse the sentiments of our comrade and, and um, you know, well-loved former AG, Anand Andalal, when he made the point today at the OAS General Council that Granger has essentially been lying, being dishonest. Because one time he says that he's going to, um, he, he described CARICOM as, as, as the most legitimate interlocutor who can resolve all of this. And when CARICOM team put together their report, he has sent one of his minions to go to the court. He had said that he will respect any ruling of the court but he has been using his minions to appeal and to file other matters all along. He had said that he respects the constitution, which we know is a joke. We all know that is a joke. That is Granger's favorite um, joke that he tells, you know, his favorite fiction uh, that he respects the constitution. We know that is not the reality. So he has been absolutely dishonest and completely lack of any integrity. Uh, Brigadier, I bring you in here. Um, how do we treat with this? This man has been hiding somewhere, but it's, as we say in, in, in local uh, terms or, or Guyanese parlance, he's stoking the fire from behind, and that is what he has been doing. Well, you know, Ed, we have seen Mr. Granger in action on many occasions. On well, very few occasions. <laughs> <laughs> He's don't hiding. have to be, He's hiding. Don't have to be like a 16th century general, you know, on his horse, you know, in the heat of battle, leading the troops against the enemy. You know, he can be somewhere, you know, in, in, his, in his headquarters and control his forces from there. What is important is having good lines of communication with your troops. And you know, I'm introducing some military terms here now. And Mr. Granger has very good lines of communications. You just have to see the actions of the APNU um, operatives out there. And you know the source of their direction. Whether they're operating in the courts, representing um, the applicants, or they're making noises over the social media, is one thing that you have to conclude that Mr. Granger, even though he's not being seen, he is in control. And indeed, he is the architect of what is going on at present. And I would like to join with those who are very close to Mr. Granger by saying the time has come for him to stop communicating lies on what transpired 
after March 2nd to his supporters. Come clean with your supporters. Tell your supporters the truth. And you know, the truth is the APNU, AFC, knew since the 3rd of March that they lost these elections. Tell the troops, tell your supporters that you lost the elections. What Mr. Mingo did was a fraud and that led to Mr. Granger bowing to a recount. And I, and I said bowing because, you know, that's another lie too. To let it look as if, you know, that he was the one who, you know, requested this recount and was pushing for the recount. I'm of the firm belief that Mr. Granger was pressured at some stage into accepting that the way to go is for a recount to be done. And to come now after pushing and agreeing for the recount and not to utilize the results of the recount, but to want to go back to utilizing Mr. Mingo's fraud to declare the elections and to have himself be sworn in on a declaration made by Mr. Mingo's fraud. It's sad for Guyana. And it brings me right back to what Charles was saying earlier. Reagan is in the DNA of the PNC that morphed into the APNU and then attached, you know, the AFC to themselves. So you have to look at the nucleus and the nucleus is the PNC. You could call them APNU, AFC, but the nucleus, the control center, the North Center is the PNC, and Mr. Granger is at the center, the solar plexus of that North Center. Everything emanates from him. And you know what? There's an old saying that a general returns to fight the last war because this is the only war that he knew. And the last war for Granger was a war on the Forbes Burnham. He, he was a senior officer on the Forbes Burnham. He became a general under the PNC regime. And the only war he knew is Reagan. And politics is war by other means. So here's the man who trained to fight a war, is in politics now, and he continued the war by other means. Reagan elections. So he is the architect. And I hope I was able to explain why I see him as the architect. Uh, All I know is Reagan. He was nurtured in an environment that promoted Reagan. And now he's at the helm. And he can only do what he knows best. And that's Reagan elections. Brother I, I, I want to go back to a point that you made earlier, um, and you talked about the recount and, and why Ranger agreed to the recount. I have a bit of a different view, and maybe we should throw that, this, this different view out there, um, that maybe Granger wasn't pressured into the recount. My view <laughs> is that after Mingo failed on two occasions, it means that they had no other option. Mingo failed, the world condemned them. And the PPP wasn't willing to allow them to use fraudulent results. Maybe Granger went into the recount, agreed to the recount, because his intention was to send his minions to the conference center to make those frivolous and baseless allegations about <laughs> voter fraud, um, uh, dead people voting, migrant votes, and, and all sorts of things, with the intention and the hope that it would have been something that they can use to invalidate the elections so they can probably try a different uh, method of rigging. And that's my view. I think Granger was trying to use a strategy, a strategy, however, that backfired on him because the allegations that he made when evidence was asked for or as Bonner Lawrence said, when evidence was asked for, 
they were unable to present any. So that is my that that is how I see it. Maybe I don't think yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't just, disagree with you. I don't think anybody remember we are dealing with people who are changing the narrative as they go as they reach a stumbling block. You know they stop and they come up with something to move them along. So we have a change in narrative. I, I, I figure, I figure, but you know, we can just um, speculate, you <laughs> know, because these guys, these guys, how these guys operate, and I'll bring you in, Charles, how these guys operate is that they tell a lie today, you know, they try it, doesn't work, they wake up the next morning and they say, hey, that one didn't work today. Let's try something else. There's Plan. no thought whether this thing makes Plan sense L or M not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Charles? Yeah, so we're talking about David Granger because, you know what, all of this could have ended a long time ago if he really was an honest and honorable man and a decent man who he likes to, so what he likes to call himself and that's what they run their campaign on. But his entire life was based on rigging. His time in the GDF, the GDF was used at certain points to rig the elections for Burnham. His own election as the leader of the PNC was a rigged election. In fact, Carl Greenidge was the one that should have been the one who became leader of the PNC, but the, the rigging group of which Joe Harmon, etc., was part of, uh, they had, and, and Robert Corbin too, all of them had uh, choreographed and orchestrated this rigging for David Granger to become leader of the PNC. And that's why I know that he can't disabuse himself from the involvement of the rigging. And that's why even when it's revealed right in front of his eyes that look, Mingo's uh, declaration had 15,000 more ballots than there existed. So when you hear the PNC say fraud is fraud and only valid votes and all this kind of stuff, Mingo's declaration had 15,000 more ballots than existed and not one single word has been, has been uttered by David Granger to even acknowledge that. Look at what happened inside of uh, the Ashman's building. The international community said that there's credible allegations of electoral fraud, of which he is a candidate to be the president. He is currently the president. He never one time came to the location to inquire what's really going on here. If you were getting elected to the Chess Association or the Badminton Association, and there's somebody that's, and, and you're one of the presidential candidates in that election, you would want to go and find out if anybody is, is alleging electoral fraud. So his actions do not speak to somebody who wants to find out about the election fraud. Instead, what he has done, Eddie, is that he is suited up on more than three occasions to get sworn in on electoral fraud. That is how concerned he is about electoral fraud, is that he is, has suited up on a number of occasions to be sworn in on elections fraud. Now, if I can interject there, Charles, before you go on, on I, I just want to add this because this fits exactly into what you said there. Apart from being suited up, first, Lowenfield gave him two thirds majority. Then he changed it to a one seat majority. And Granger wasn't concerned? Unconcerned. Took seven, 7 of his votes. This man has taken away so much votes from you and so much seats from you. And you don't care. You don't care because all you care about is that you become president again, no matter how if people think that it's free and fair or if, it, if, if the society is destroyed and the country is destroyed 
as a result, as it would be if it, this is what were to happen. Look, and two, just two quick points, because I know that we're going to be coming to an end pretty exactly. soon. That same, that same Aubrey Norton that you hear talking all the time, who in the late 90s or so was chased out of Congress place and was called by Desmond Hoyt, the creature. You hear him talking all the time about in support of electoral fraud. In uh, the election where David Granger became president, um, the leader of the PNC, sometime around 2012 or so, he was blocked, denied entry of that very election where he was wanting to stand to be the ca a candidate or the leader for that party. He was blocked by his own party in a, in a maneuver where it was rigged and he now wants to foist rigged elections on all of us. I had a friend who came back into the country um, shortly after, uh, just around the night of the election or, or maybe the day after or so. And they met Aubrey Norton at Orange Walk. And because he had campaigned for the AP and UAFC in 2015, he felt comfortable speaking to this guy. He said, the, the guy who came in, he asked the, Aubrey Norton, how is it looking? And Aubrey Norton said, well, it, it, it don't look good, but, you know, we got to do what we got to do. They know that they have to rig this election. And that is why you see them. They don't care that it's, whether it's Mingo declaration, low field declaration, a, a, a fraudulent declaration, a semi-fraudulent declaration. They don't care. They, their only mission is to get back in power, even though it would be fraudulent. And I want to just say one thing, because I know that uh, a lot of our viewers are going to be concerned about what's going to happen next as it relates to this case. So in the previous CCJ case, the court could not issue coercive orders or orders that would see a swearing in of the party which won the election based on the recount, and that was the, CC, that was the People's Progressive Party, because the only issue that they were asked to, a, to adjudicate on was the issue of jurisdiction. So they could not make any orders other than to set aside the Court of Appeal ruling that they had in the Eslin David case. In this case, however, this, was, this is the case that will annihilate any other possible litigations that you will see, that you could ever see as it relates to uh, slowing down or the, the inevitable swearing in of the People's Progressive Party. Why? Because in this case, their last card was Lowing Field. Their last card was to tell the world that Lowing Field was the, the, the second person only to God. And that whatever it is that he presents to GCOM, that GCOM must act on this, this report that he presents. No matter if his report says that the PPP get five votes instead of 233,000 uh, votes, or he says that we get no votes, they must, like some kind of idiotic robot, must swear in uh, whatever president that comes out of Lowen Fields bottom. So this case is going to determine that definitively. And what I can tell you is that the, the, uh, the Chief Justice's ruling already has already been very clear. It will be very difficult for the Court of Appeal to rule anything differently. And what I can also tell our viewers is that the CCJ will go to town on the APNU AFC and give them a public whipping in front of everyone because what they have done is dishonestly misinterpreted their own ruling of which they were an applicant present in the case, misinterpreted that ruling to say that the CCJ had invalidated the recount order when nothing of the sort happened. In fact, 
they implicitly endorsed the recount. And you would have shown that paragraph that shows that. So when they go to the CCJ, or whenever the case reaches to the CCJ, which will only be in about a week's time, that the CCJ will destroy them because it will be a deliberate misinterpretation of their ruling in the Eslin David case. And it's something that everyone should take time out of their day to witness because we will laugh at them for the rest of their professional lives and political lives, and they will remain in opposition forever. Thanks, Charles. Um, we're almost out of time. I'll give Sonia a minute to uh, her closing comments. Uh, uh, Brigadier, I'll also give you uh, maybe two minutes to, to wrap Well, up. back to your, well, I'll just close on Granger's dishonesty. Really, Eddie, there is really no toothpaste that can wipe away the stench of the lies. <laughs> there is not. There is absolutely not. You know, there was a reason why he was voted out. The dishonesty. We had no confidence. He completely disregarded. He was dishonest in relation to that ruling and many other rulings. They were voted out because of that. Now, he... It's what you call his fangs are start, were starting to show since then. And he has become totally, totally dishonest. So today when I heard Karen coming saying, asking Anil Nandalal <laughs> to retract his statement that Granger is dishonest, I thought to myself, I, I mean, I, I out loud thought to myself, this woman has to be out of her mind. The entire <laughs> world and the country knows that he is dishonest. It is exactly why he was voted out, you know? And he continues to, he comes out and he has agreed to everything that the coalition has put forward. He hides when he sees it convenient. When he does come out, he will make some lunatic statement that is that, that, that carries their narrative. And that is what we've been seeing all the time. The, the, you know, he has been called a sanctimonious gangster for a reason. When you say it like that, it means that you are putting pious and you're putting criminal in the same sentence. You're putting it together. So it, it, he's the only person who seems to think that he's not dishonest and uh, along with the AP and you can. He confirms all of them. He is, he is, he's a full-blown dictator as far as I'm concerned. And I have to agree with Charles that the CCJ, now that the, this matter will inevitably reach the CCJ. And when it does, the CCJ has the leverage to extensively make orders and consequential orders that will give this country some relief or the relief that it deserves. Because Guyanese does not, they, they, we do not deserve what we're getting. And Mr. Golding was quite correct. He said, Guyana does not deserve what it's getting. We are being treated horribly by somebody who was supposed to govern us. So I will say that what they have campaigned on was a complete lie. Everything that they've based their governance on, on is a complete lie. So he is basically dishonest to say the least. Well, Ed, you know, the time is now for the APNU AFC clean to level with their supporters, to level with the people of Guyana and say in the loudest voice to the people of Guyana that they've lost the elections. And by saying that, they will be also saying to the people of Guyana that the PPPC won the elections. And having said that, they need to step aside. And that term did not originate from me. They need to step aside and allow the PPPC to form a government, a government for the people of Guyana. And to let us continue on the path to develop development for all the people of Guyana. That is what the people need. And that's what we are ready to deliver 
the people. We have been elected to serve the people for five years and the people should have been benefiting from our plans 140 days ago. However, it's never too late. We're calling on Mr. Granger and his APNU AFC coalition to concede and allow us to form the government and serve the people of Guyana. Thank you and so I much. Ask the people to be calm, continue to be calm. You've been calm for 141 days. It's just a matter of a couple of days more. Yes, we have the matters before the court. It's just a matter of a couple of days more. And you will get the government that you voted for and the government that you deserve. Thank you so much, Brigadier. And I just want to join with you also to, 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 to make that call. Uh, you know, we're not too big to apologize. I think Ranger could simply apologize to the people of this country, um, especially the supporters that you have misled them. And to say to them, you know, I pull a bluff, but it didn't work. We lost the election. And concede <laughs> so that we can move forward, not only in the interest of supporters of the BBB, but also supporters of AP and UFC, because like you rightly said, Brigadier, uh, the BBB scene will be a government for all Guyanese, regardless of who you voted for. We don't ever ask you, um, despite people like Bob Lawrence, you know, saying that she's only give walk to, P to PNC people and so on, the PEP has never asked you to show party card. The PEP has never asked you which party you voted for before you access services. And that will never happen. I, I, can, I can assure that much. So I agree with you that uh, Ranger should just set aside. Um, I don't want to go back to the term used by um, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez of, of what should happen. But um, I, think, I think the time has come. Uh, Guyanese have suffered enough. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic. So, I mean, Rachel, at least have a, a little bit of a love in your heart for the people of Guyana. Well, I, Eddie, you're very optimistic, and I, I, I really love that. I, I love that we can still be optimistic in this amidst the, the, this gloom. However, um, I think that when Dr. Irfan Ali is sworn in and the PPPC assumes government, we can safely say that the APNU's government is res judicata. I yeah. believe so. <laughs> Thank you so, so we much. can say that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being part of the program this evening. We're going to Mark Phillips, okay. Prime Minister elect, uh, Sonia Rag, right. <laughs> and Charles Robson. What a way to end the program, Sonia. And to our viewers, we want to say thanks for being part of the program. Have we a good evening. Talk to you with you Have tomorrow. a good evening. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Charles. Thank, Thank you, Eddie. And thanks to the people yeah. of Guyana yes. <laughs> once again. All right. <laughs>